Tonight, the U.S. strikes back with a cyber attack. I'm not looking for war. And if there is, it'll be obliteration like you've never seen before. But I'm not looking to do that. But the message over military action against Iran, well, that's mixed, leaving allies confused. The dangerous game of brinkmanship. The one day of the year they don't get judged for who you are or what you do. Showing their pride on the streets of Toronto. Why last minute security was called in for Canada's largest pride parade. We have to pay attention on climate change. It is costing our cities and towns across Canada a fortune. Vancouver has big ambitions to be the greenest city in the world. So is it working? Practical lessons to fight climate change in our backyard. This is The National. Across the Middle East tonight, there is dread. The U.S. threatened bombs but didn't send them. Instead, it struck Iran differently. According to multiple reports, the U.S. went ahead with a cyber operation targeting Iranian computer systems. Ever since Tehran shot down a U.S. drone Thursday, eyes have been on where this is going next. The U.S. and Iran both denying they want war, even as they find ways to dance closer to the edge of it. Kim Brunhuber takes us through the threats from both sides. Iran can never have nuclear weapons. That, from Washington, is the bottom line. And a further warning, just because Donald Trump chose not to launch airstrikes against Iran doesn't mean he's taking the drone incident lightly. Neither Iran nor any other hostile actor should mistake U.S. prudence and discretion for weakness. After all, the U.S. did retaliate. It launched cyber strikes reportedly against Iranian missile control systems and an intelligence unit. From Trump, it's the carrot and the stick. On one hand, announcing more sanctions against Iran. On the other, saying that if the country gives up nuclear weapons... We'll call it, let's make Iran great again. Does that make sense? In an interview that aired today, Trump said he would agree to talks without preconditions. I'm not looking for war. And if there is, it'll be obliteration like you've never seen before. But I'm not looking to do that. But you can't have a nuclear weapon. Iran says it won't go back to the negotiating table under pressure, which has been building since the Trump administration pulled the U.S. out of the international agreement signed in 2015 to contain Iran's nuclear ambitions. That led to the rapid tightening of U.S. sanctions against Iran. In response, Iran has been building up stocks of enriched uranium. The country is set to violate the nuclear agreement in a matter of days. And today, Iran's deputy foreign minister announced that decision would be irreversible. A senior Iranian military commander also warned any conflict in the Gulf region could spread uncontrollably. As if to underscore that point, today Iran-backed rebels in Yemen claimed responsibility for attacking a Saudi airport with a drone, reportedly killing one person and injuring seven. And I think both sides, uh, for the moment, are escalating, but escalating with prudence. Now, war is a, a tricky thing, military action is a tricky thing, and, and things could spiral out of control pretty quickly if uh, there is uh, a misjudgment somewhere along the way. So Some the doubt Trump's judgment, saying the mixed messages are confusing enemies and allies alike, while Trump's supporters say his aim is clear, to make Iran great again, but only on America's terms. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Now, the Trump administration says it plans to announce new sanctions against Iran tomorrow, but Iran has its own ways of causing pain to the U.S. or its allies without triggering full-scale retaliation. Iran has built a chain of well-armed allies stretching all the way to the Mediterranean, which it uses to challenge the U.S. and its friends. The drone attack today on the Saudi airport followed another airport attack earlier this month, also claimed by Iranian-backed rebels in Yemen. Last February, Israel shot down what it claimed was an armed Iranian drone sent from Syria. Also a threat for Israel, Hezbollah, an Iran-backed militia that holds serious sway in Lebanon. Finally, there's the Strait of Hormuz. That's where six tankers have been attacked, including two just 10 days ago, adding, of course, to the recent tensions. 
one-fifth of the world's oil ships through here. So any serious disruption will take a heavy toll on gas prices, even here in Canada. For some Canadians, the impact of these tensions runs far deeper. There are more than 170,000 Canadians with roots in Iran. Briar Stewart spoke with some of them in Vancouver today. And now we are in a shaky situation. Inside K. Ismailipur's home, he's scouring media reports. Like so many others, he's watching with concern as tensions escalate between the U.S. and Iran, a country he left more than 15 years ago. My family is my people in Iran are wishing to have a, a sustainable democracy and peace. They chanted death to America. Death. He says Iranians have been living with the prospect of war against the U.S. for decades. He says the current crisis is deeply rooted in regional conflict, so this goes much further than relations between Iran and the U.S. All of the stakeholders should uh, get on the board and talk and solve the problem. So I keep telling my friends that if war happens, I probably would go back to my country. I think it's almost impossible to sit here at peace. Golsa Golustane is a student at Simon Fraser University and has organized rallies in Vancouver to support the people of Iran. The sanctions situation is just so backbreaking that people are more focused on surviving the day-to-day -day life rather than what's going on with the politics of war because they're like, oh, we, like, they're not sure if it's going to happen. And with President Trump promising more sanctions against Iran, daily life could get harder. Young generation, they believe there is no future for them. Ebi Mosani hosts a Persian radio show in Vancouver and says Iranians back home are concerned for their safety, but some are hopeful that U.S. involvement could lead to a regime change. Some people they believe that this is the answer to get rid of the dictatorship. Ask another dictator to get rid of this one, bullying each other, what, what they're doing right now. But war is war. Which is why so many Iranians are anxious over just what might come next. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. It was part street party, part push for equal rights, one of the biggest pride parades on the continent marched through Toronto today. Happy Pride! Happy Pride, everyone! And there he is, helping lead the way, the Prime Minister. Behind him, around 200 different groups and something added at the very last minute, beefed up security. Now, that addition was made after anti-Pride protests turned violent in other cities. As Talia Ricci explains, for some, that is proof that after decades of marching, this parade is still needed. It was all sunshine and rainbows in Toronto today, as thousands lined the streets dancing and cheering. One time of the year when everyone just comes together and just shows their true color and be whatever they want to be. Quietly, extra security kept a watchful eye, both on rooftops and along the route. We just want to make sure that it's, it's clear to those who would seem to tort um, our celebration of um, queer and LGBT pride um, to ensure, that, ensure their safety and the safety of our participants. This after a fight at the nearby Hamilton Pride Festival last week, resulting in several injuries. Their organizers say the protest was led by religious leaders from the United States and Canada, who intentionally came to hatefully disrupt the event. We're actually from Hamilton, and that definitely did not deter us from coming out. We feel more enthusiastic about showing our support. Everyone has their beliefs, and everyone's entitled to their beliefs, but if your belief involves hating someone else, that's, that's not right, in my opinion. But it is real in this country. In 2017, there were 204 hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation reported to police. That's up 16% from the year before. One of the reasons some people still consider this parade a protest. I think if we just come from a place of inclusivity and just enjoy together, uh, we'll get there eventually. Highlighting the importance of the Pride Parade, a message echoed by the Prime Minister. I think it's important. 
uh, not just for everyone who's out here today celebrating, for people who are at home. Uh, young people especially who uh, uh, are still worried about coming out, still worried about their communities. Despite the concerns, Pride organizers tell us there were no incidents at this year's parade, nothing that could dampen this party atmosphere. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. From security worries in Toronto to those in a small, picturesque community in B.C., some in Dawson Creek are afraid an ugly movement is taking root in their backyards. The Soldiers of Odin is an anti-immigrant group recently banned by Facebook as a hate group. It is also considered a possible security concern by federal authorities. But as Rafi Bujakanian explains, some fear the local RCMP and city officials are not taking the threat seriously enough. It is vital that we speak up against hatred in our communities. Dawson Creek is the kind of place Stephanie Gowdy wants to call home. That was until the soldiers of Odin started showing up. Now she's taking a petition to city council and other politicians demanding they denounce the hate group. I think it's tacit acceptance. If you're not openly saying this is wrong, uh, we don't want this here. Uh, you are basically turning a blind eye to something that could become bigger, that could influence people. The soldiers of Odin have been seen at anti-immigrant rallies across Canada. But here in Dawson Creek, they've been showing up at Take Back the Night Walks, meant to support women and minorities who feel unsafe alone out after dark. I was very taken aback that this was happening here in my community. The soldiers continue to claim they're a community group, not a hate group. They refuse to speak to us for the story. A couple times they showed up in backgrounds of photos. The editor of the local newspaper says he's surprised that many local leaders haven't condemned the group when reporters sought out their stances. It was strange that we didn't get more opinions from normally traditionally people that want to talk to the media about everything under the sun. Last October, a local RCMP detachment did address the concerns of people like Stephanie. There also has been no criminal element associated with the self-proclaimed members that are within Dawson Creek right now. At this time, I do not believe that there's any concern for public safety in relation to that group or the recruiting efforts within Dawson Creek. The soldiers have not been involved in anti-immigration activities in Dawson Creek. But anti-hate experts warn against the lax attitude about their presence. When this apathy happens, we make space for these individuals to bolster their recruitment and to spread their ideology. And what we get is violence in the end. You can't spread a, a violent ideology and message without that resulting in violence at some point. The mayor says he's anything but lax. We were very clear about denouncing any message, any organization, any group that's going to promote hate within our community. But it's not enough for Gowdy. She'll continue protesting the group. And organizers of those Take Back the Night walks, they've apologized for not vetting participants closely enough. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Dawson Creek, BC. Today was a day of celebration in northern Thailand, one year after the beginning of a saga that captivated the whole world. A boys' soccer team and their coach entered a complex underground cave system only to become trapped by rising floodwaters. Well, today, the boys and the rescuers from around the world came together. The wild boar soccer team and their coach gathered today to celebrate the rescue and just being alive, one year after rising floodwaters trapped them underground. They also took part in a marathon and bike race to raise money to improve safety at that cave site. Some of the rescuers right there with them. How many of you? 13. Brilliant. The world, of course, exhaled when the boys were found alive a full nine days after they disappeared into the cave, surviving on very little food or water. But how to get them out? Weak and tired, they could only wait as rescuers worked out a plan that wouldn't accidentally kill them. And while they sat in the dark for another week, rescue experts from around the world arrived, turning the rescue camp above into a small city. The plan? Divers would go in, fit the boys with oxygen tanks, and carefully pull them out one by one through the tight passageways. It worked, though one diver, a Thai Navy SEAL, died in the effort. 
17 days after they went into the cave, all 12 boys and their coach were back on solid ground. And a world starved for good news celebrated. Just as the survivors did today, a little older, certainly a little wiser. And the story doesn't end there. Production just wrapped on an independent film about that saga called, appropriately enough, The Cave. It should come out later this year, and Netflix is getting in on the action, too. The streaming giant now has a movie of its own in development. Here are some of the other stories we're watching on The National tonight. Air Canada is investigating after a sleeping passenger was left stranded, locked inside a plane all by herself. It happened two weeks ago on a flight from Quebec City to Toronto's Pearson Airport. In a Facebook post, an Ontario woman says she was, quote, full-on panicking when she woke up alone in a pitch-black cold cabin on the tarmac. She says she eventually managed to get the door open and a ground crew employee finally spotted her high up on the plane and got her down. We're going to see a lot more demonstrations the next few weeks. On the day of the uh, when Boris is declared Prime Minister, there'll be a blockade of Downing Street uh, to stop him getting in or going to see the Queen. There was a very small protest outside the home of Boris Johnson. He is the front runner in the race to become the next UK Prime Minister. That was after police showed up at the home late Friday night, apparently because of a loud argument between Johnson and his partner. His critics say the incident shows he's not fit for the country's top job. And that is the sound of a major victory for the opposition in Turkey. The second time Ekrem Imamoglu has thanked his supporters in the last four months. He won Istanbul's race to become mayor again. His election in March was annulled by Turkey's president, who was demanding a do-over. Many people say this is a sign of political change to come. Okay, so that's terrifying. Some scary moments at a hot air balloon festival in Missouri this weekend when a balloon plowed through the crowd, knocking several people down. It was trying to be landed in windy conditions. And as bad as that looks, there were really only minor injuries. A little girl was hurt and a woman simply cut her hand. And coming up, the latest in our series on the impact of climate change in our backyard. Ian sits down with our special panel to evaluate Vancouver's plan to become the greenest city in the world. And later, could the Raptors coach be headed for the Hall of Fame? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? The head coach of the Toronto Raptors. The story behind Nick Nurse's big solo is our moment. But first, six months after blasting off for the International Space Station, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques will soon be the man who fell to Earth, and he is expected to have a wild ride back. Well, there's always an end to everything, so eventually have to pack up. It's uh, bittersweet, of course, looking forward to going back home, seeing my friends and family. Tomorrow afternoon, Saint-Jacques and two international colleagues will push themselves into their Soyuz capsule and plummet back down to Earth. That's been described as like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. If the falls were 400 kilometers high and the drop took six hours and the barrel was on fire. Oh, and as soon as their chute opens, they will feel like they're in a giant yo-yo. But after six months in space, they will enjoy all the pleasures of gravity again. So. What will that feel like? Here's how a doctor with Canada's space agency describes it. He will feel really heavy because he hasn't felt that heaviness, the G's, at all for six months. So just lifting his arm will be very, very difficult. So to recap, it will be no limo ride, but then again, maybe a small price to pay for setting a new Canadian mission record, 205 consecutive days in orbit. Canada is continuing. Canada is keeping uh, staying at the forefront of innovation, exploration. That's the kind of country that I'm proud to give to my kids. To Ottawa, where a frenzy of legislation kept senators working late into the night before their summer break. 
And while dozens of government bills were passed, many from private members just died. Like one aimed at having judges train in sexual assault law, backed by former interim conservative Rona Ambrose. And an NDP bill to bring Canadian laws in line with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. All of that, despite efforts to make the Red Chamber less partisan. As Olivia Stefanovic explains, those reforms may still have a long way to go. A centuries-old tradition being shaped by modern reforms. May it please your excellency. 33 bills have been adopted this session with at least one amendment, a record in recent history brought on at the same time as the Red Chamber has seen an increase of independent senators. Five years ago, before he became Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau expelled every single Liberal member of the Upper House. Since forming government, Trudeau has introduced a system to appoint independent senators, recommended by a non-partisan review panel. But not everyone thinks that's for the better. I personally have termed it Trudeau's fake independent Senate. Conservative senators accuse Trudeau of appointing liberals masked as independents. When it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's likely a duck. For example, they point to the debate around a bill that would ban oil tankers from a portion of the B.C. coast. It narrowly passed by only three votes this week. Every conservative senator voted against it. In Her Majesty's name... The face of sober second thought is undeniably changing. Nearly half of senators are now female, a dozen Indigenous. But even the small number who consider themselves liberal have concerns about the role of independence passing legislation. That sometimes can be uh, a bit of a, a hindrance. The government representative in the Senate acknowledges there's more work to be done. This is the first parliament that has had as its objective less partisan, more independent uh, behavior. But the question is how much longer will the objective of having an independent Senate last? Not long if Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has his way. Scheer says he will abandon the notion if his party wins in the fall. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Still ahead on tonight's National, from pop stars to entrepreneurs, we will hear from some of the voices behind last week's protests in Hong Kong. But next, Eight years ago, Vancouver vowed to become the greenest city in the world by 2020. So how's it going? Over half of people are walking, biking and taking transit every day. So we've exceeded those kind of goals. Uh, on the other hand, most of our, our emissions, our climate pollution comes from our buildings and burning natural gas in buildings. And that's going to take many more years to shift. Going green, Ian has that conversation as our series Climate Change in Our Backyard continues after the break. In 2011, Vancouver set a very ambitious goal to become the greenest city in the world by 2020. Well, here we are, 2019. Let's see what kind of progress it's made. Over the last 10 years, the environmental impact of the average Vancouver resident, their eco footprint, well, that shrunk by 20%. And here's a major reason why. Between 2006 and 2016, the percentage of people in the city who have switched their commute to bicycles or transit or walking, well, that's up by 21%. This is the car sharing capital of North America. With more than 3,000 vehicles, there are more car shares here than any other city in North America. There is a municipal gasoline tax, a transit tax, which often makes gas the most expensive in the country. It's also very expensive to park throughout the city. Put all that together and this is, by design, an expensive place to drive. And here's a statistic that surprised us. Right now in Vancouver, one in 15 jobs is related to the green economy. For example, making energy efficient products. So it's not just the relationship of the city to the environment that's changing, but also its economy is being transformed as well. 
So is Vancouver on the right track? And are there lessons here for other communities across the country? We've brought together three people who know a lot about what's been going on in Vancouver over the last few years. Sitting next to me, Javeria Veldkamp, Manager of Green Economy Initiatives at Vancouver's Economic Commission. Mark Jackard from Simon Fraser University assesses sustainability strategies and has consulted at various levels of government in this country. And Gregor Robertson, former mayor of Vancouver, responsible for the 2020 plan and now an ambassador for the Global Covenant of Mayors, so representing mayors and communities to, to the UN on uh, climate issues. So a beautiful day here in Vancouver and a perfect opportunity to talk to the three of you about green cities, a term that, that you guys know very well but may seem a little bit nebulous to, to some people watching. So, so let's, let's make it concrete. Mark, uh, let's start with you. Well, I think it, it, it can be a very nebulous concept because it can mean a lot of different things to different people, whether you, you've got nice local parks, a greener city. But uh, a lot of the initiative today in the world when we talk about green cities and, the, and what they should be doing, it's to do with reducing greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. And, and that's to do with the gasoline we're burning in our cars or the natural gas in our homes. I think being able to walk, bike or take transit versus drive a, a car by yourself that's an, an obvious individual choice, but that rolls up a, as a green city where in Vancouver now over half of people are walking, biking and taking transit every day. So we've exceeded those kind of goals. Uh, on the other hand, most of our, our emissions, our climate pollution comes from our buildings and burning natural gas in buildings. And that's going to take many more years to shift, uh, shift all of that building and home infrastructure to renewable energy. I think perhaps some of your viewers might not know this, but Vancouver's experienced the fastest growth in Canada for the last five years straight. And economic we've done growth. Economic growth, that's right. We've grown our GDP by 26%. At the same time, we reduced our carbon emissions by 11% since 2007. So Vancouver's proof that you, know, you can protect the environment and it doesn't have to hurt jobs you can decouple your economic growth from your environmental footprint. Because I think I hear from a lot of people this sense that going green might be the right thing to do, but it's going to be the expensive thing to do. Uh, is it more expensive? What we find is business is really supportive if they can see that there's gonna be a level playing field. Uh, when we were leading up to the UN Climate Conference a few years ago in Paris, we had 200 businesses all say, look, we're taking strong action on climate change and we want national governments around the world to do the same. And they're doing it because it's good for their bottom line. Uh, a lot of companies in Vancouver work to reduce their carbon and sustained efforts to reduce those costs can save them 30% uh, in their operating costs. Mark, I wonder if there are some people in different parts of the country who are watching this and shaking their heads now, not, not on the climate change issue or the importance of it, but they look at this city and they say, yeah, easy for you guys here to be advocating uh, greener cities, but it doesn't seem to make sense for wherever they happen to be watching this from. What would you say to them? Well, I would say that in terms of greenhouse gases, it's are you using more clean electricity? Maybe some biofuels as well, maybe hydrogen, but it's really clean electricity. So in one part, you need a higher level of government, a provincial government or a federal government to say, we're not gonna burn coal anymore. Well, British Columbia's government did that about 15 years ago. There was about to be two coal plants built and they stopped that. They said, all of our electricity will be clean. Now that's sweeping right across the country. Alberta says it's phasing out coal plants and is rapidly decarbonizing, we call it, its electricity system. And now federally, the federal government is doing the same. So now you've got clean electricity. So you're in a city anywhere. You don't have to be in a city like Vancouver. And you now have options to do what Vancouver did. And you know a lot of buildings across Canada use electricity right now for space heating and cooling. And the question is, how do you get more of that to happen with new buildings, with retrofit? Those are policies that Vancouver has done really well on. It does lead the country, but it's so easy for any other city across the country to follow that. Gregor, you're a former politician, and with that comes, I think, a bit more freedom to talk about political costs. And when you pushed for more bike lanes on the Burrard Bridge, the Canby Bridge, and behind us now, uh, I know people who, who found that really irritating. Mm -hmm. What about the political costs of your Green City initiatives? 
Well, I think as elected leaders, our responsibility is to the, to the greater good and to the future. And we, we have to pay attention on climate change. It is costing our cities and towns across Canada a fortune going forward. Uh, we, when we have natural disasters increasing, we have sea level rise, we have uh, smoke from fires now plaguing us uh, in fire season. And, and that means making changes in our lifestyle, making ch changes in our traffic patterns, in our buildings. Uh, th that's the responsibility of leadership, not only political, but also in business and at the community level. Javeria, you know a lot about the, the business part of this and, and buildings and the demand for, uh, for green materials. Tell us, tell us what's happening in Vancouver in that regard. Yeah, I mean, a couple of points, starting with the buildings. So we have a, a building code, a energy step code in BC that nudges builders to slowly improve the energy performance of their buildings over time. So the idea is by 2032, all buildings built in BC will need on net zero energy to run. And um, in Vancouver, we have a zero emissions building plan that is a similar kind of policy. I think what's important to remember is policy can drive industry innovation. Uh, it can be a tool for market transformation. So we looked at these policies in BC and it's driving a $3.3 billion market. Just so, in so, Metro Vancouver. So it's interesting, right? Because when you say that at first, it sounds like an interesting theory. You're seeing it actually happen in practice. Give me an example yeah, of that. Yeah, so a uh, local company, Cascadia Windows and Doors. They make super high performance windows that we're gonna need in our energy efficient buildings. They've grown 25% in the last 10 years. And the next five years, they're gonna add five to 15 employees every year. Uh, another company, Core Energy Solutions, they make heat recovery ventilators. These also need to go into green buildings and they're gonna see demand triple for their product as a result of these policies. So there is real ways that policy can drive innovation if it's done smart and if it's done in partnership with industry. And that energy savings is realized by people in their homes. What, what we realized in Vancouver was that about $50 million of energy costs had already been saved because of the changes we made to make builders build more efficient buildings and, and to retrofit the old buildings so they perform better. So that, it's saving people money every day and it's creating new jobs uh, in our economy. So in terms of lessons for the rest of the country, uh, if there's one thing that you would want to leave uh, people watching uh, kind of a goal for them or a cautionary tale. Mark, let me start with you. What would that be? Well, I am going to say uh, kudos to Gregor because while he sounds kind of modest describing, uh, you know, he had a lot of support, as you pointed out, even whether it was uh, bicycles on a bridge, um, you, you need politicians who are sincere and, and you need to be able to see if they're actually really acting on that. And so it, I, I unfortunately must say, I've been involved in this for 30 years across the country, and too often I've been on a, a radio panel or a TV panel with a mayor who says, we have a passive house in our town. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, I've heard that so many times. <laughs> and, and whereas I'm waiting and saying, wait a minute, as citizens in a town, you need political leadership that's saying, here's how buildings are going to be built differently next time and here's what we're doing to retrofit existing buildings and they need a concrete policy that uh, as you were saying affects everyone it's a level playing field it isn't just a few things that the media can shine a light on it's actually something that makes the wholesale change happen javeria i think the biggest advice or takeaway is you know set your goal and make it public these public commitments to be the greenest city uh, or Norway wants to be carbon neutral by 2030, they really send a signal to the world that you want those best ideas, you want that green capital, you're gonna support green entrepreneurs. So it's more than just a political slogan. It's followed by action and it really has worked in Vancouver. Today, one in 15 Vancouverites works in the green economy and that's the result of a very intentional strategy that we've been implementing for 10 years now. And to the former mayor of Vancouver, last word to you. Well, I think it's important to, to keep the whole community or the whole country in mind here. And I, I think un really unfortunately, Canada's in a very rancorous debate about energy, about fossil fuels, about where we're going uh, with our economy. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity here to, to turn that around and, and make an agreement that we're gonna bring each other along here. We're gonna support each other province to province, city to city in making the changes, being smart, being thoughtful, thinking about our future, 
and recognizing that some families uh, do depend on the fossil fuel industry uh, and all of us are burning fossil fuels in our lives basically so we need to figure out how as a country and as our cities we shift off of that in a way that supports each other. Well we're still working on becoming a greener city but it sure is a beautiful city. Great talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Ian. Just ahead, Hong Kong has been rising in defiance over Beijing's extradition law. The anger runs wide and deep, and they want the world to know. Hong Kong is now becoming a battlefield between an authoritarian state and the rest of the free world. If Hong Kong is collapsed, when one is enslaved, all are not free. And tomorrow on The National, Canadians will be going to the polls in October, which means those trying to influence your vote are already hard at work. Not just the politicians, but the disruptors with their disinformation. How to handle that is what we're tackling tomorrow night. For all the warnings about interference in next fall's election, the messing with your minds and votes by foreign and domestic actors, the bad news is it's already here. That's election interference. You can absolutely argue that this is someone acting outside of Canada, publishing, in some cases, completely false or just completely unsupported stories, who is having an effect on what Canadians think and believe. By flooding social media with these kinds of messages, you do create doubts. People start believing, could this be true? Can I trust the government to, uh, to protect me? And that goes a long way to eroding trust. Interrupting election interference to more on The National. After weeks of massive protests, the streets of Hong Kong are relatively quiet, but that could always change. The controversial extradition bill that could see Hong Kongers sent to mainland China to face its draconian legal system has been suspended, but not withdrawn. So tonight, our Sasha Petrasek talks with some of the most determined voices of Hong Kong's opposition to it. It's another protest day, and the battle lines are drawn. I'm here just feeling furious. Hong Kong's bitter voices, millions of them, taking on the government in march after march. To stand firm and understand how, how important democracy and freedom really is. A government they see as uncaring, with a plan they call evil and it's ignited a fear far deeper than anything this place has felt in a long time, fear of China. One of those voices is Denise Ho. The anger and the frustration and all this disappointment, it has always been our, in our hearts. She's fierce on the street, <laughs> familiar on the music charts. Ho is not just a protester, but a canto pop star in Hong Kong, whose songs have included several protest anthems that provided the soundtrack to Hong Kong's umbrella movement five years ago. As it turns out, Ho grew up in Montreal. For me, Canada is you know, another home. So uh, I think what I have learned there, I am applying it right now here in Hong Kong. That education that I got, you know, that people should be independent and free and we should have our own rights, that has made a very great impression on myself. And she's making an impression here. But pop stars aren't the only ones driving this people power. It's been a remarkable coalition. Brokers from Hong Kong's financial towers, mothers from the outskirts, unions and churches. Millions of people joining the angry young men and women who've been the traditional foot soldiers for Hong Kong democracy. Those students are here too, of course, right on the front lines, ready to confront the police, getting bruised, shot and gassed in return in ways Amnesty International calls excessive force. By far, most protesters have been peaceful, and by far, they sympathize with the students. But they are very brave. We are so proud of them because the students are standing at the front line. Gary Chu is a high school teacher. 
Like many Hong Kong teachers, he's been at all the protests with his family, arguing against the extradition bill, which he fears will allow anyone in Hong Kong to be extradited to China to face its harsh and arbitrary justice system. His students fear it too, and he's seeing them take a much more assertive role in challenging authority because of that. They need to. They need to keep this a special status of Hong Kong. I think they want to live when they will be grown up. They want to live in a city that uh, you have uh, the freedom of speech and the freedom from fear. And he says there's a lot at stake for the rest of the world too in dealing with China. Hong Kong is now becoming a battlefield between an authoritarian state and the rest of the free world. We want to let the international society know that when, if Hong Kong is collapsed, when one is enslaved, all are not free. So the international society, please keep Hong Kong as it was. Hong Kong has been gradually losing its freedom since China took over 22 years ago. Opposition voices have been silenced or jailed, protests limited, and foreign reporters kicked out. All this despite a pledge by Beijing to respect its more democratic system. Now even business is condemning the proposed law. Corporate groups and small companies are normally reluctant to criticize the government about anything here. This time, some, including Lai Chun Kit, joined the call for a strike, closing his web design company one day to allow staff to protest. Why lose business? It's not the time to count how much we lost, but how much we can do for our home. So uh, we decided to shut down our business on that day. And uh, we have also told our clients uh, we will join the strike. He says for some business people, attitudes may be changed for good. I think if the China, uh, China government continues to impose any law in Hong Kong, uh, we will become more aggressive. That may happen if the proposed extradition law is revived, or it may wait for the next attempt for Chinese laws to reach into Hong Kong. But it seems pretty clear protests here are no longer limited to small numbers, narrow interests, or quiet voices. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Hong Kong. Just ahead on the National, the Toronto Raptors' Nick Nurse delivers our moment off the court and on stage. champion coach and now guitar god. The story behind his performance, up next. The band Arkells are apparently Raptors fans, like a lot of people in Canada now, and they're pretty observant, noticing that when coach Nick Nurse was off the court, he was carrying around a guitar everywhere. So. After the Raptors won the championship, the band took a chance and tweeted, hey, Nick Nurse, you're welcome to guitar solo at any Arkell show for the rest of time. Well, good thing they meant that because Nick Nurse took them up on the offer at a concert last night, and that moment is our moment. Give it up. Everybody was going crazy. Uh, people were singing the song as well because it's, you know, quite a catchy, iconic tune. But people were yelling at the same time, let's go Raptors. He joined in with the other guitarists and they sort of went up to the riser to the drum set. And they were sort of swaying back and forth in unison and getting, getting really into it. The players themselves are uh, around the city, embracing the city, and basking in the glory, and, and rightfully so. To see these guys hang around and interact with, you know, a Canadian band uh, such as the Arkells, it just shows their their love for the city and the love for uh, the people of this country.
He's a natural. And yes, signed, sealed, delivered. Perfect song for him. We asked our Kells about this, and they sent us a statement saying that they'd seen him, you know, with this guitar throughout the championship, figured he was practicing throughout. And they said, we figured he deserved a shot of the real thing. You know what? The practice paid off. It was a thrill to have him on stage with the whole gang. He was awesome. And that fan you heard there talking about spotting the Raptors everywhere, it's true. Niagara Falls, Home Depot, these gentlemen are not leaving Toronto, and that's just okay. That is a national for this Sunday, June 23rd. Good night.